Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Natalie Klein, and I'm here this evening in several different capacities. First of all, as president of the Australian branch of the International Law Association, uh, also a professor at UNSW Faculty of Law, and additionally, an affiliate member of the Caldor Center for International Refugee Law. With all those hats on, I'm delighted to welcome you to this seminar. And in welcoming you this afternoon, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the traditional lands of the Vigigal people of the Aurora Nation. And uh, I would like to pay my respects to the Vigigal people as the traditional custodians of this land and uh, extend that respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to any other Indigenous people who are joining us here this evening. Now, this uh, seminar is a third in a series on COVID-19 that are being jointly hosted by the Australian branch of the International Law Association and UNSW Faculty of Law. As you would all no doubt be aware, the consequences of the pandemic are particularly severe for those who are most vulnerable in our societies, already facing considerable hardship. We need to think carefully about the impact of COVID-19 on refugees and other displaced people and what responses are necessary now and also looking ahead. So for the discussion for this evening, I'm really very delighted uh, to be joined by Assistant Secretary General Julian Triggs and also CMT Professor Jane McAdam. Uh, Jane will be speaking first and I'm sure is well known to many of you as the Director of the Andrew and Renato Calder Centre for International Refugee Law at UNSW. Jane will be addressing the differential impact of the pandemic on displaced people and showcasing the Caldor Center's blog, COVID-19 Watch. And we'll also consider the twin crises of COVID-19 and climate change on mobility in our region. Uh, Gillian is the Assistant High Commissioner for Protection with the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And Gillian will be considering how COVID-19 has undermined the fundamental norms of human rights and refugee law, as almost no other crisis has done. She'll be discussing some of the longer term challenges uh, that we need to consider to ensure that some of the regressive laws that have been adopted are not baked in, and that the social and economic impacts of the pandemic on the most vulnerable people are addressed. So just by way of logistics, for those of you who have just joined us, you'll see, of course, that your uh, videos and uh, microphones have been muted to be able to help with the bandwidth for everybody who's joining us. And uh, a special shout out to those of you who are joining us via the live stream on the Caldor Center's Facebook page as well. Now, for those of you who are here in the Zoom setting, you are able to post questions about the presentations in the chat column. And after Jane and Gillian have both spoken, I'll pop back in to raise those questions with our speakers. But for now, a very warm welcome to both of our speakers. I'm very happy to hand over our video screen uh, to Jane to begin. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Natalie. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have Gillian Triggs back with us as well. Well, Natalie asked me when she um, invited me to be part of this seminar whether I would reflect a little bit on why the Caldor Centre established its new blog called COVID-19 Watch. We felt that there needed to be a dedicated space where we could explore and analyse the impacts of COVID-19 on the world's displaced people. Refugees, but also people who are displaced within their own countries, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people as well. The blog is a, is a live ongoing watching brief essentially about the lived experience of being displaced in a pandemic. And it's also a forum for new ideas and critique, a platform for awareness raising and advocacy, and perhaps really importantly, a historical account for posterity. Now, I realise that this is a seminar jointly hosted by the International Law Association and that we are a centre for international refugee law. But one thing that we were keen not to do was only feature the voices of international refugee lawyers. Because, as we know, the protection issues facing the world's displaced people are not for lawyers alone to solve. And while international law provides fundamental principles and standards for setting and evaluating the actions and policies of governments, 
law is only part of that picture. We need other perspectives to show us the gaps on the ground and also to ensure that we have a range of different voices and actors empowered to lead. When we thought about creating this blog in late March, I'd been really struck by some comments starting to emerge in the Australian media from Australians who'd been brought home from overseas and were being put into quarantine. And understandably, they were complaining about how their movement was being curtailed, and in particular, how they were often separated from family members. Now, while I had a great deal of sympathy for them, and certainly don't mean to dismiss those concerns, I kept thinking that this is what refugees and people seeking asylum experience all the time. In fact, this pandemic might well be the very first time that Australians and others from the so-called global north have had to consider what it actually means when you can't move around freely. And whereas for most of us, the measures will be temporary, for those who are displaced, this limbo is often permanent. So what have we learnt so far? Well, what's clear, as Natalie said in her introduction, is that COVID-19 is having particularly detrimental effects on refugees, people seeking asylum and other displaced populations, whether they're living in sprawling camps, in overcrowded informal settlements or safely within resettlement countries. Many refugees have fled danger and extreme violence, been uprooted from their communities and cultures and all they know, and have left family members behind. Many have lost years of education or livelihoods, have been stuck in limbo for years on end. Many have been confined to camps or detention centres. Yet others have won the resettlement lottery, but have family members still stuck overseas in conflict zones and other precarious circumstances. And on top of all that then comes COVID-19. We know that the impacts of the pandemic have hit displaced communities particularly hard. For people living in camp settings or close quarters of detention centres, physical distancing is nigh on impossible. Sanitation is often poor and there's a much higher risk of disease spreading. Testing and medical treatment may be rudimentary at best and absent at worst. Five refugee leaders who wrote for our blog explained how refugees have been excluded from healthcare systems in hard hit countries like Iran and how asylum seekers in Greece were stuck in cramped conditions ripe for the virus to spread. Refugees living in the community may have little or no job security, savings or family support. For instance, we were told through one piece that the shutdown of Uganda's economy has rendered previously self-reliant refugees destitute. People seeking asylum are often in a particularly precarious position, working in the informal economy and having no formal entitlements to social security or other assistance. And both asylum seekers and refugees may have relatives in camps or conflict areas overseas, about whom they're now even more worried than they already were. One of our priorities with the blog was to provide a platform for refugee voices and refugee-led solutions. So in some of the contributions we've had from refugees themselves, as well as by scholars and humanitarian officials, there is unanimous recognition of the need to better support and resource outstanding refugee-led initiatives. Since refugees are, and long have been, the first responders in a situation of crisis. For the time being, we're also likely to see more remote humanitarian assistance. And as some of our commentators have noted, one of the humanitarian community's greatest assets will be affected communities themselves. Refugees typically are the first responders in their communities, and this is no different in the pandemic. In fact, it's probably even greater. In her article, Najiba Vadivadavost, uh, tells us about people like Mahidia Zahidi, an asylum seeker nurse in Australia who's working 10 hour shifts in her local clinic. About Muhadessa, a teacher who volunteers help with remote education. And about Yavad, who provides emergency food packages to undocumented refugees in Iran and Afghanistan. A new global advocacy initiative called Refugees Rise 
is bringing together refugee leaders to mobilise support for their communities in response to the pandemic. As another powerful contribution noted, there's a clear need for urgent action for refugees, but also recognition and amplification of the action already being undertaken by refugees. But a problem that so many contributors identified is that refugee-led organisations are generally forced to run on a shoestring budget with really limited resources and not donor funding. For instance, the UN's Global Humanitarian Response Plan for COVID-19, which has requested $2 billion, won't be directed towards refugee organisations themselves, but rather to the usual multilateral actors. So this is why we would like the COVID-19 Watch blog to get people thinking about how can we do protection better? What proactive responses and solutions exist? What promising practices can we see around the world that we can emulate and learn from? Can COVID-19 help to reset the protection agenda in a positive way? There is certainly an opportunity to redouble our efforts and rethink how we enable protection in the post-COVID-19 environment but it's certainly one that I recognise will have its challenges. That said, international cooperation has never been more important. As the UN Secretary General said, COVID-19 is menacing the whole of humanity, so the whole of humanity must fight back. Individual country responses are not going to be enough. While governments have needed to react swiftly to limit the spread of the virus, we must still hold them to account to ensure that the measures they're taking are non-discriminatory, are provided for by law, and are reasonable, proportionate, and necessary to protect public health. Furthermore, they must only exist for as long as they are truly necessary. One very useful document that's been created in this respect is the set of principles of protection for migrants, refugees, and other displaced persons in the COVID-19 pandemic which was drafted by a group of international lawyers, and in full disclosure, I was one of them. It was spearheaded by Columbia University's Program on Forced Migration and Health, along with Cornell Law School and New York's Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility. The principles have been endorsed already by over 800 experts, and they set out 14 guiding principles derived from international treaties, other international instruments, customary international law, and international and regional jurisprudence. The idea being that these principles will be able to inform and guide actions by government and to provide a basis for information and advocacy. Before I finish, I'd like to just touch briefly on the relationship between COVID-19, displacement, and climate change. In the middle of April, parts of the Pacific were ravaged by a Category 5 cyclone, with Vanuatu being the worst hit country. As people fled to crowded evacuation centres, they tried to shelter from the storm, and then they pitched in together in the aftermath to try and clean up what was left, with physical distancing measures all but impossible. Around a third of Vanuatu's population was left homeless, and border closures and strict quarantine measures meant that delivery and humanitarian assistance and the distribution of external aid couldn't get in. And that's obviously part of the recovery effort. UNICEF's representative for the Pacific Islands described the situation as a disaster wrapped in a catastrophe inside a calamity. We already know that climate change is a threat multiplier amplifying existing challenges and making responses all the more difficult. So here, the intersection of Cyclone Harold, a high intensity extreme weather event consistent with climate change, on top of a global pandemic, is an example of the perfect storm. However resilient people might be, there will ultimately be a tipping point when capacity becomes overwhelmed. As the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum explained so eloquently, the COVID-19 public health emergency and its ensuing humanitarian and economic fallout offers us just a glimpse of what the global climate change emergency can become 
if it is left unchecked and if we do not act now. COVID-19 has certainly shown us just how interlinked our economic, health, welfare, education and other systems are, as well as how fragile they can be. What we're seeing now is a concentrated version of our future. Climate change is the crisis in slow motion, whose ramifications will be at least as profound and long lasting if we fail to take action now. On that note, I'd like to hand over to Gillian Triggs. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jane, from that, for that very, um, very helpful introduction um, and congratulate May I congratulate you on, on the, the very idea of a blog to get these ideas across. Um, uh, thank you to the International Law Association and of course to the Calder Centre for this, um, this opportunity to speak. Um, and perhaps I could begin by saying, um, as an Australian who's now had the last eight months in Geneva, uh, I had actually forgotten the respectfulness of recognising the Indigenous peoples uh, before we begin to speak. And it's a very important um, uh, recognition. I think that Australians uh, have been adopting and we now do as a matter of course. Um, I, thinking uh, from my own position, I'm here in Geneva, uh, looking in fact from my office window at the very beautiful Mont Blanc, uh, shrouded in, in cloud and rain, uh, but remembering also what a very ancient environment this is, the crossroads of Roman, uh, Roman development and, and, uh, and, and development of power, in fact, uh, here on, on the shores of Lake Geneva. But also it's a very important place uh, for the creation of the Covenant of the League of Nations and the, uh, the um, remarkable Palais Wilson and uh, sitting on the shores of Lake Geneva, reminding us of the growth of international law after the First World War, but particularly the Second World War. I'm a great supporter of the ILA and it's always wonderful to see how strong that uh, Australian branch is. Um, I've been connected with it for a very long time, not always a financial one, but nonetheless connected. Uh, and of course, um, uh, very um, much a supporter of the Calder Centre. So with those thoughts in mind, I thought I might um, remind us all uh, that COVID has posed challenges for international law in a way that I think we could never have imagined. Um, and th the irony is, of course, that we are now coming into the 70th anniversary of the Refugee Convention, of the aspirations of that, of that convention following the Second World War, uh, following the Charter of the UN and, and uh, pulling together the, the horror that the international community as it then was, uh, saw in the huge numbers of refugees uh, unable to uh, return home or uh, needing to return under some sort of uh, protective legal structure. Well, when I began here at, at, uh, at UNHCR last, last October, it was a period of very considerable optimism and opportunity because the overwhelming majority of states in the international community had agreed in 2018, just two years beforehand, uh, to the global compacts, one on migration and the other on refugees interconnected in many ways, but the Refugee Convention, obviously, uh, uh, compact is the one that, that concerns us. And what that uh, compact did was to pick up many of the points that Jane has made, and that is that we need to respond to the unprecedented numbers of refugees, internally displaced persons and, and stateless persons uh, in a way that is, is universal, that reflects the interconnectedness of the global environment we live in. Uh, and that the only way we could respond to these problems uh, was with global solidarity, but also with equitable sharing of the burdens and responsibilities for those in need of international protection. So this was a, this was a very important moment um, in terms of international collaboration. Um, it was not a legal document, uh, it wasn't the sort of treaty that many of us have been used to reading and, and trying to understand and, and uh, give effect to within our domestic laws. But it was a treaty, uh, but it was a, a document, a declaration of good faith and goodwill in understanding the importance of shared responsibilities. Uh, the numbers we're now talking about and perhaps something that, that drove that, that compact uh, are now close to 80 million people who are now 
uh, formally uh, persons of concern to, to the refugee uh, community and to, of course, uh, UNHCR. Uh, and the harsh reality is that 85% of those people are being cared for and hosted by the poorest countries in the world and middle income countries in the world, largely in the global south. The funding for UNHCR and for the work of UNHCR and other humanitarian organizations is provided by the, by the global north, uh, but not in a way that really picks up the, the dimensions of that level of responsibility. For example, uh, Turkey hosts uh, three and a half million uh, refugees from Syria and has done so uh, in, in a commendable way uh, for the last nine years. Uh, we still have no solution to that problem because it's largely unsafe for Syrian refugees to return home. Well, it was in that environment of optimism and a different approach to, to developing uh, um, global solidarity that we moved um, very shortly after my arrival at UNHCR to the, 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 the Global Refugee Forum. And that was, um, to quote the words of the High Commissioner for Refugees, the makings of a success. There were 1,400 pledges and commitments by states, by the business community, by civil society, by NGOs, and by refugees and refugee-led organizations themselves. It was, it was something of a phenomenon. Nobody expected that we would get such a strong response globally uh, to uh, implementing the, the, the aspirations of the compact. Um, but of course, the High Commissioner was wise in saying it was the making of a success because everything depends ultimately on implementation. Would states follow through on their pledges? Uh, was this actually going to work in practice? And that, of course, became uh, one of the major parts of my work here in Geneva. But who could have imagined within weeks of the uh, December Global Refugee Forum last year that we will be facing a global health pandemic? And one uh, pandemic that compounds the existing crises that impact vulnerable people in situations of conflict, inequality, environmental degradation, and poverty. And so, as Jane has pointed out, COVID-19 has become a crisis on top of other crises in which the fundamental principles of human rights and refugee law are under serious threat. And let me explain uh, why and how that has happen happened. And perhaps we could begin with the statistical realities. And they are uh, that 161 states have partially or fully closed their borders, and at least 99, 100 states make no exception whatever uh, for people seeking asylum, seriously limiting the rights of those in need of international protection. Uh, this is reflected in the uh, failure to rescue those at sea, particularly in the Mediterranean and the Andaman Seas. Uh, that disembarkation now has become extremely difficult, ad hoc, uh, and uh, leaving uh, people, particularly uh, Rohingya, uh, Bangladeshis, uh, floating around uh, in the seas, dehydrating and uh, uh, lost and rejected, really, by the international community as a whole. Yeah, UNHCR is also observing a mounting pressure for those forcibly displaced to return to their countries of origin when it's safe to do so. Um, but also we've seen a willingness to risk reform contrary to the fundamental principles of the Refugee Convention. So just in, uh, on the basis of those very simple facts, we can see that the underlying principles of the Refugee Convention, the right to seek asylum uh, and, and to have those asylum claims assessed according to the uh, standards of international law uh, and the absolute prohibition against the return uh, of people to danger are now at risk in a way that, that they have not been at risk uh, for, for many decades. Uh, I never imagined that in my career, in, in the, the now the, approaching the third decade of the 21st century, I'm actually having to advocate for those two core principles. Um, and my concern, and one that uh, Jane was kind enough to print in the, in, in the, in the blog, uh, is that while arguably some of those uh, restrictions will be necessary and proportionate according to international law and national law. Uh, 
uh, we're concerned that they will be baked in, they will be become entrenched in the years that follow when the COVID-19 finally subsides. The point that we have made very strongly in UNHCR is that it is possible to do both. A state can both defend its borders to protect its uh, public health, as well as meet the fundamental standards of, of refugee law. Uh, we now have remote um, interviewing processes going forward. Uh, it's possible to quarantine. It's possible to uh, do proper identity and security checks, but to do so in a way that meets fundamental human rights. Um, and, and that has been the challenge that uh, far too many states have seen the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as an opportunity to impose restrictive policies that we fear will not be uh, brought back to the normative position once COVID has, has finished, or at least subsided. But there's another element to this that is, that is also, of course, concerning, and Jane has referred to that, and that is that the almost immediate impact of COVID-19 uh, has been felt in socio-economic um, terms. Uh, of course, the economic impacts are felt throughout the world for many, many millions of people, and we're seeing those numbers rise uh, daily of people who've lost their, their jobs. Um, but the, 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 the key point is that the 80 million persons of concern, displaced people, um, refugees, asylum seekers, stateless people, are among the most vulnerable in the world. And they are uh, working typically in the informal economy, and they are the first uh, to lose their jobs. And it was really as astonishing here um, at UNHCR how quickly we uh, were um, receiving information from our 400 offices around the world, how quickly we were receiving evidence of the impact of COVID-19 economically uh, on, uh, on those uh, in, in these um, uh, vulnerable economic situations. And equally quickly, we saw how rapidly um, the lockdown was impacting families, refugee families and IDP families, um, and the rise of sexual uh, violence. So they were, they were concerns that, um, of course, were, were true of the general population, but we, we think there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that there's a particular impact on, on, uh, on, the, on the persons of concern. Beyond those, we, of course, see the immediate impact on children. Uh, um, uh, UNE uh, um, UNESCO uh, and um, UNICEF have reported 1.5 billion children have been out of school for protracted periods. And again, we fear that it will be refugee and IDP children uh, and stateless children who will be the ones who will most immediately suffer. And we may very well have a missing generation of children uh, who will not be uh, getting at least even basic levels of education as a consequence of the, this um, position. And there are also <coughs> other emerging problems with regard to <coughs> excuse me, persons of concern, people with disabilities are very heavily represented amongst uh, refugee and IDP communities. The LGBT communities suffering stigmatization uh, and uh, rising numbers of deaths amongst indigenous peoples. And, and we return again to the recognition in Australia of our own indigenous peoples, but we're, we're seeing this in Colombia, um, in other parts of, uh, of, of Africa and, and, and Latin America, where indigenous groups are suffering in particular uh, from from the COVID-19 pandemic. What the pandemic has demonstrated is why the principles of the global compact are so vital. Um, it, is, it is shocking to realize that uh, countries in Africa uh, with 80 million uh, in, in populations have four ventilators. Um, that's really just one graphic illustration, but what, we've, what the COVID-19 has done is to demonstrate the fragility of uh, health systems in many parts of the world, uh, but also uh, has underscored the root causes that lead to these unprecedented numbers of people on the move for one reason or another. Um, there are some good parts to the story. Um, there have been uh, many states that have uh, accepted the responsibility for IDPs and refugees within their communities. Uh, they've adopted uh, registration procedures which use the technology. Uh, they have uh, readily accepted children into education systems and they have uh, suspended 
um, or at least given extensions to visas for those who, who have visas uh, so that there's a, a level of documentation. So it's not a, an entirely grim picture by any means, uh, but, but it is one that um, uh, raises very significant protection problems at a general level. Um, perhaps I can say just a little bit about UNHCR's uh, responses. We have, uh, as you know, we deal with emergencies. Um, again, just to give an illustration, a million bars of soap go to Burkina Faso and, and Mali in the, in the Sahel. Um, we've been providing shelters. We've been providing psychosocial support. We've been trying to work with, um, with uh, families and women and, and young girls in particular uh, because of the rise of, of sexual violence. Um, we've been working with community groups. Uh, we've been trying to, lo re uh, uh, to, to localize what we're doing as part of a general process here at UNHCR uh, to ensure that uh, we are giving a voice to refugee, refugees and refugee-led organizations, as, as, as Jane has pointed out. It's a very important part of what we purport to do. So there's the emergency work that we do, um, working with, uh, with faith-based organizations in communities. Uh, but one of the other very interesting uh, uh, emerging practices from, from this COVID emergency is the use of remote technologies. We've, of course, always used them to a degree at UNHCR to get to communities uh, in conflict where we haven't otherwise been able to, to, uh, to, to, to be on the ground. But now we are scaling up that technology and ensuring that we we have contact uh, because we're not other, otherwise able to deal with, with the people we need to deal with. Um, some of it's very sophisticated technology and depends on internet connections. And very many parts of Africa do not have those internet connections and parts of Latin America and Asia as well. Um, so what we're doing is, is, is uh, moving to quite simple solutions. Um, community groups have been providing their mobile phones uh, to uh, to families in distress with credit on those phones so that they can connect the relevant with the relevant agencies. Um, just again, a, a very particular example in Mali, um, the community groups have been able to access radios uh, so that it's possible to get the information about uh, hygiene, uh, good health, and information about access to services uh, through um, through these radios, but also to provide uh, education. Uh, through radio transmission to uh, children who would otherwise uh, not be able to have access to that educational facility. And something, of course, that Australia is very, very used to with our long distance education that we've done for, for many, many decades in Australia. And these are areas where, of course, we can, we can connect up and, and support each other. So um, we will be in the future scaling up hotlines and call centres. It's expensive, uh, but we believe that this is really a, a way of the future. But I think my time is, is, uh, is, is very much up. Um, uh, there are many aspects I'd, I'd love to be talking about, but perhaps I can conclude by bringing us back to the principles of the Global Compact. Um, it was a noble aspiration. Um, the attention has moved away from it, of course, in the last, uh, last few weeks. But I'd like to bring us back to the language of that, of that uh, compact, because I think um, that we now understand, perhaps through the... Through the, through COVID, why the principles of the compact are so important. This is an interconnected, interconnected and global environment and we will not solve these problems unilaterally. Uh, if anyone is affected by the COVID crisis, everyone is. And the same principle applies in relation to refugees. We can no longer exclude or give particular legal status to those uh, who are, are seeking international protection. We must include uh, refugees and in, uh, displaced people within national systems. It's unfortunately been the case that during the COVID crisis, although UNHCR has uh, stayed and delivered in our 400 uh, 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 offices, uh, the reality is that our resettlement program has had to be suspended. Um, that I believe is the first time we've ever done this in the history of the UN across the globe. Uh, we hope, of course, that it will, re will restart. But the, but the reason I mention it in particular is that if resettlement is not possible and we will not meet our goals this year, if voluntary repatriation is not possible, two of the key, if you like, branded ideas of what it is UNHCR does, we are left with uh, integration, inclusion, 
and working on self-sufficiency so that uh, refugees and IDPs can survive in the environments in which they find themselves. So the idea of inclusion and sharing of responsibility becomes ever more important. So I'll finish there if I may. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk to you. It's great to be back in Australia as it were, uh, and to know that uh, the ILA and the and Calder Centre are, are going from strength to strength. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Gillian, and thank you, Jane, for those presentations. I think you've given us all a, an extraordinary sense of the scale of the issues that we're dealing with in this regard. Um, let me turn to some of the questions, and certainly if anybody else listening, please feel free to post some questions uh, for our speakers as well. Um, Gillian, you just mentioned that, that it's the first time that the UNHCR has suspended its resettlement program, which is really quite striking to think that that has had to be done in the current circumstances. Is that, I mean, when do you see that wrapping up? And is that also true for people who are stranded in countries of transit as well? Are they also being affected in the same way? Uh, yes, uh, there has been, um, there has been a, literally a, a lockdown a, a, a globally. Uh, okay. we, could, we could no longer find the flights that would link those that we have proposed to states for resettlement, we could, could not find the, the flights between the countries where these people are stranded or, or, or waiting in many cases for years to the countries that have agreed to resettlement. Now, one of the merciful uh, um, situations or the realities is that the states that have promised to take re uh, refugees re uh, proposed for resettlement have not resiled from those obligations. So we're now waiting for the flights to be to be become available. And we are optimistic that they will, after the middle of June, towards the end of June, those flights will resume and states will will live up to their their um, agreement to accept. Our, our uh, aim this year was 70,000. We're, we're probably going, not going to get close to that. Uh, but we we hope that we'll get at least 50 or so thousand resettled and rebuild the program the following year. Thank you. Um, now, Gillian, I think you, you touched on this in terms of the many restrictions on access to territories. I think that's Jane. I could uh, ask you one question that's come through about how we can really go about ensuring the, the fundamental right to protection, um, particularly in countries that have not signed the Refugee Convention. Sorry, did I miss a little bit? Did, was that for me or for Gillian? Uh, well, I think Gillian touched on it a little, right. so I thought I would give you a go. Put it to me. That's fine. Sorry, it just cut out when you mentioned the name. Um, no, it's a it's a really good question, and I think as Gillian also, you know, as Gillian said, it's absolutely fundamental that the principle of non reforma is upheld. Part I and mean, part of it goes back to um, what the UN Secretary, Secretary General said, which is and Gillian reiterated, no single country can resolve this. We're all in this together. And in fact, it's in all our interests to help those around us um, and, and rather than to create further divisions. And I think it is possible to balance the rights of refugees and commitments to protection alongside public health measures. I mean, it, it's absolutely possible to do that. Um, it, it depends in terms of how do you appeal to a government. Um, that may well depend on the kind of government you're trying to appeal to. In some contexts, um, notions of human security re will resonate, even though the country itself might not be a signatory to the Refugee Convention. Um, human rights law, of course, also contains these fundamental principles of protection, but the resonance that that kind of language has is going to depend quite significantly on the particular context. I think that... Um, you know, notwithstanding what Gillian said about the number of border restrictions that have been put into place, there are still some, albeit small, numbers of um, unaccompanied children, for example, being resettled. Um, interestingly, the United States is still taking people from Manus Island and Nauru. Um, in fact, the, our latest blog, as an advertisement, that's just gone up this afternoon, is precisely on what's happening there. Um, where people said, notwithstanding the uh, disastrous situation in the United States, they'd still rather go there now than um, be stuck offshore. 
Um, and I think too, ultimately, it's a question of, not ultimately, but in addition, it's a question of monitoring the, the restriction, restrictions that are put into place. Um, you know, that's... It, that's one of the preconditions, if you like, to ensuring that these things don't become baked in. Um, and that's where if you have formal derogation mechanisms in place, states have, are required to constantly report back on why it is that they need to maintain those derogations to fundamental rights. The Refugee Convention doesn't have that kind of mechanism. Um, but for states that have derogated from the ICCPR and the right to freedom of movement, uh, certainly they are supposed to report back on why restrictions are still needed. We know though that other countries have put these in place without those formal derogations. So I guess that's where it comes back then to um, national monitoring and, and constant calling into account as to um, why restrictions are there and why they can't be eased when other restrictions are gradually being um, reduced. Thanks very much, Jane. Did you want to add to that, Gillian? Uh, just, just very briefly, if I may, um, Natalie, I think uh, I'd just like to to pick up on on, on the point that um, that Jane has made about the need to in include the refugee voice and refugee organisations. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the um, one of the comments that is being made about the funding exercise, um, as you may know, six point five or six billion have been have been asked uh, requested through through the funding process through the Secretary General. Uh, UNHCR has been relatively successful in making funding, but one of the points that's being made, and it's a fair point, is that it takes a long time for the funds to get from the organisations uh, down to uh, to the local level and to NGOs. And many NGOs are, are sort of running out of money and unable to provide assistance. One particular example of that is, is in Idlib. Uh, but the point I wanted to make is, of course, we 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 are growing in our understanding of the need to to hear the voice and to include the voice of refugees. But something I've been learning in this position is that so many of the of the policies and laws that that deny fundamental rights, whether they're broad human rights or refugee law, doesn't really matter, depend upon governments to change them, and the and advocacy must now include much closer relationships with governments and government representatives. Civil society is important, faith-based groups important, uh, business community enormously important uh, as advocates. But we have to face the reality that in terms of dealing with the, the laws that, that, as I've said, 161 countries closing borders, if we want them reopened and we want those, these asylum processes to be uh, established according to proper process, we're going to have to work very hard with governments. And perhaps I can add that more than 30 states have, in fact, explicitly derogated from their obligations under human rights treaties and the Refugee Convention. So that these are very, very worrying developments. And it, it underscores the fact that we really need to have effective advocacy in the areas in which we can actually uh, ensure a return to those fundamental principles. Right, thank you both. Um, look, I'm, I'm happy to throw to either of you with this next question, which concerns uh, people in detention. And uh, we've been asked that people in detention are at particular health risk in the context of COVID-19. In Australia and other contexts, visitors have been restricted, including lawyers and monitors. So how do you think we can ensure that these measures are proportionate and don't undermine human rights? Would either of you like well, to think on that one, Gillian? Well, I, I think we, of course, are very concerned at the use of immigration detention, administrative detention, as as uh, as as courts and and governments term it, uh, for effectively imprisoning people uh, for very significant periods of time, if not in some cases indefinitely. Um, it's of concern, of course, to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that. Michelle Bachelet has spoken up about this on a number of occasions, as has the Secretary General. Uh, we have to monitor this, um, and uh, it, it, in some ways it's not too difficult to monitor because it, you know, we, we can get evidence as to how long people are being held. But being held without access to the courts, without access to due process, is again a fundamental breach of human rights law and very worrying. It's not something that all states uh, have done, and there have been some very positive examples of states uh, that have been releasing um, asylum seekers uh, because they do not want to risk uh, crowded 
uh, in, uh, unsanit or insanitary conditions in detention centres, it's better to, to release people. And that's been one of the, the curious and positive uh, impacts of COVID-19. But, uh, but it is extremely troubling in, in, in some countries uh, rather more than others. And I suppose I, I agree with that. And I suppose I'd just add in terms of how do you ensure measures are proportionate, if, if restrictions elsewhere are starting to open up, you know, if people are unable to um, go into hospitals or nursing homes or, or other environments that have been somewhat closed, obviously differently from detention centres, well, if it's safe to do that, then why can't it be similarly made safe for visitors, lawyers, monitors to go into detention centres? I think if, you know, if you can undertake social distancing measures and all, all these other things that apparently make it safe for us to go to restaurants and uh, school and whatever else, um, what is it about the detention context that is different? And if for some reason it is so unsafe, then why on earth are people still being held in that environment? So, you know, I think in terms of, of that holding to account, there's some of the questions that need to be asked. Yes, there's no Perhaps shortage of could... paradoxes there. Sorry, Gillian. That's right. No, I was just going to say that's, that, uh, if, if you'll excuse a, a plug for my former position, but um, uh, that is why the now, I think, 121 national human rights bodies are so important because they do have the legal uh, power uh, to, uh, to inspect and, and to monitor what's going on in these, uh, these so-called uh, immigration detention centres. Uh, so we need those structures to be, uh, be recognised and, inf and enforced. Otherwise, we will not be able to ensure accountability. Yes, indeed, thank you. Um, perhaps, uh, Jane, this might be one for you. The virus has vastly disparate impacts on certain communities. Could a government failure to provide adequate health care or social service to certain groups amount to persecution under the Refugee Convention? If, if there is significant harm and there, it is clear that the uh, withholding of those um, services is targeted because of your race, religion, nationality, political opinion or membership of a particular social group, then certainly we have many examples of that in the past. Uh, Michelle Foster's work on um, deprivation of socioeconomic rights, um, I would commend to people to read because um, that's precisely what, uh, you know, part of what that, that entails. In fact, Australia's Own Migration Act recognises that extreme forms of socioeconomic deprivation can indeed amount to persecution. So, um, provided there is the requisite link with the Refugee Convention, uh, sorry, with yes, with the grounds of persecution, the Refugee Convention, uh, and obviously all the circumstances of the case, individual case being considered, then in principle, yes, that could found a refugee claim. Right, thank you. Um, Gillian, you were talking before about the roles for civil society and even business groups and others, and, and there have been a couple of questions about what these particular groups could be doing um, to contribute to the efforts to promote protection for displaced people. And also there was a, there's been a question of concern about the increasing restrictions on NGOs. So, you know, in terms of those sorts of restrictions in, in engaging in advocacy, is that, do you think, another consequence of COVID-19, another dimension that we're going to need to take into account um, in promoting protection and um, dealing with some of these issues in the, right now and in the longer term? Well, I think in so many respects, COVID-19 has, has, has exacerbated pre-existing circumstances. It's shone a light on, 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 on matters that, that, that we were aware of beforehand, but, but, but were not so magnified as they have been by, by COVID. And one of them is the shrinking space for civil society. Um, and it's something that the Secretary General has uh, spoken about uh, many times. Uh, we've seen um, attacks on, on civil society, restricted abilities to advocate, um, uh, and, and more recently, of course, a, a lack of funding, and, and that, so that the work of the NGOs is being, uh, is being uh, severely restricted. I should say that uh, UNHCR, which of course um, uh, does the emergency work, as I was describing earlier, I should uh, have pointed out that much of that emergency work is actually carried out through, through NGOs through civil society, um, are funded uh, through them. And if we don't get the funds and get the money to them quickly, then we, we've really let them down. 
Um, but we hope that we will be able to get some of these more recent funds to those NGOs as quickly as we possibly can. But the, but the deeper question is the one that, that you're, you're raising, and, and that is the, the, the um, growing attacks on, on human rights defenders, uh, growing attacks on a reduction of the space in which NGOs can operate. And that is something I think, again, they're not, they're more difficult to talk about. You, you, you can talk about funding to an NGO, you can talk about the, 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 the shrinking space for them in, in Idlib, Idlib, for example, where, you know, we have nearly a million people displaced. Um, but, but when you talk about the more abstract aspect to this, uh, in fact, it's much more dangerous. Uh, that, uh, but and that's why you need uh, the Secretary General and Michelle Bachelet and others to speak up for preserving that space and protecting the rights of of, uh, of um, defenders. Uh, but just recently, of course, we, we've seen the extent to which journalists are being increasingly attacked and uh, are trying to 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 tell the story, and yet they too are being open to to increased uh, attacks. So these are worrying times, but times when we really do have to speak up for these these fundamental aspects of an open democracy. Thank you. It's fine. Um, perhaps, uh, I mean, Gillian, you mentioned that there are some good news stories that have uh, come out of recent times and certainly even the release from the detention that was mentioned a moment ago. Um, I wondered, are there any particular examples of good practices that we can look to in terms of ensuring refugee rights in the context of COVID-19? Well, I think one of the most um, encouraging has been that most countries have uh, admitted refugee children, uh, IDP, you know, internally displaced children, and, and stateless children without documentation, and there are unknown millions of these. Uh, states have admitted them into the into education system. That seems to be almost a bottom line. That 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 is what most countries will accept, and that's been encouraging. Uh, similarly, countries have understood the key point that COVID nineteen um, must be dealt with across the community as a whole in an inclusive way, and that's been relatively successful. Not always, but all, but in most countries, they have included. Um, those in need of international protection within those systems. Where things are starting to break down is in access to the social safety nets um, uh, and access to jobs. That, 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 that's really the area in which we're seeing the, the, the worst cases. Um, but we're seeing some wonderful, wonderful examples. Portugal, for example, has, um, uh, has suspended, um, uh, uh, has suspended the I'm using the wrong word, has has um, extended uh, visa rights for those, uh, temporary visa rights for those seeking asylum. So that while they would otherwise be timed out, uh, they are nonetheless now uh, uh, with legal documentation. Um, Colombia has received something like 1.34 million people from, uh, from the, the Venezuelan diaspora and has done so in a very inclusive way. Um, and we're seeing examples of this across the world. So um, it, it's, not a, no, it's not an entirely grim picture, um, but in the areas that are perhaps the most troubling, um, we, we, we've got mixed, mixed uh, responses. For example, um, 850, 900,000 people fleeing um, Myanmar two years ago or more uh, to Bangladesh. Bangladesh has hosted uh, nearly a million uh, in the Cox's Bazaar area. Uh, we have been, of course, desperately concerned that Cox's Bazaar would be an area where we would see an outbreak of COVID-19. So far, the numbers amongst refugee communities have been very small. We have some deaths, we have some cases across, the, uh, across camps and in urban areas for refugees, but relatively small. And that's going to be a source of, of, of consideration and inquiry, of course, in the future. What's made the difference? Um, but uh, but we we've also seen in the Bangladesh environment where people are attempting to flee by boat to Malaysia. They're being pushed back. Uh, where they're being rescued at sea, mercifully, they're being taken to Bashan Shah, uh, which is an island off Bangladesh. Uh, 
uh, with um, accommodation for, for refugees and asylum seekers. But we're deeply concerned that that will become another offshore island way of externalizing um, the responsibility to refugees and asylum seekers. So if you take any particular country, you're seeing quite a mixed pattern. Um, it's it, 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 some good practices and some that we are very concerned about for the future. Uh, the pattern or the, 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 the um, one of the risks that we're particularly concerned about is, it, is the growing externalization of responsibilities to refugees and asylum seekers, uh, particularly from Europe. Um, and using the language, interestingly, and I'm being very frank here, but using language of the compact of burden sharing, but using that language to say, we will provide funding to North Africa or to impoverished Latin, America country, Latin American countries, but we will do it on the basis that they take care of the numbers to stop people moving north across the Mediterranean and up into Europe or from the Balkans across into Europe. So uh, th that, is, that is a matter of concern um, because we have to somehow find a balance between burden sharing financially uh, and ensuring that we are not um, preventing people from making um, a genuine uh, and good faith claim for asylum according to the principles of, of, of refugee law, as James uh, pointed out. Thank you. Look, I, I see we're coming up on our time. I'm sorry I didn't quite get to every single question. Uh, there was one last one, on a recent one, on uh, what we would like to see the Australian government doing uh, for <laughs> improved protection at this time. And I suspect that would take us much longer than about the 30 seconds we have left. There's probably many options in that regard. Um, but I do want to, to finish by thanking you both so much for your time uh, this evening and really thoughtful uh, consideration of the many different issues that we are dealing with in the face of the pandemic and dealing with uh, international refugees. And, and I appreciate you, Gillian, acknowledging your, your long-term friendship with the ILA. And of course, you're welcome back as a financial member at any time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, also, thank you to everyone who has joined us uh, this evening in our, our wonderful new Zoom world and also on Facebook with the live stream as well. I hope all the technology worked out okay. Um, and to that end, I have a huge sort of thanks to make to various people in the Caldor Centre, Francis Nolan, Francis Boone, uh, Lauren Martin, and also to Chris Katzelis here at UNSW for helping uh, get everything together. And my thanks to Kaylin Chen at the ILA too. Uh, for those of you following the series, our next one will be in three weeks' time. It will be dealing with uh, COVID-19 and human rights, and we'll be very pleased to welcome uh, Scientia Professor Louise Chappell, who is the Director of the Australian Human Rights Institute, and also Elaine Pearson, who is the Australia Director of Human Rights Watch, uh, will, who will be coming to talk about the impacts on human rights, both in Australia and internationally. Uh, so tickets for that will become available shortly. Uh, I hope we'll be able to welcome you back to future seminars. But now, thank you all so much for coming along and I wish you all a good evening. <laughs>